Carl Sagan once said, the universe is a pretty big place. If it's just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. But what if we're not alone? What if the moment we reach out into that vast silence, we seal our own fate? It's a question that haunted Sagan, and it's one that continues to haunt us today. For centuries, humans have looked up at the stars and dreamed of contact. Stories of benevolent visitors, shining ships, and cosmic wisdom fill our imagination. But Carl Sagan knew better than most. Reality doesn't bend to our wishes. In fact, he warned that making contact with an advanced extraterrestrial civilization might not be the blessing we hope for, but a catastrophic mistake. Think about it. On Earth, when a less advanced civilization meets a more advanced one, the story almost never ends well for the weaker side. Entire cultures have been erased. Languages, traditions, even whole populations wiped out, not always through malice, but through sheer imbalance of power. Sagan understood this pattern. He knew that humanity, in all its brilliance, might look fragile, even primitive, to a civilization millions of years older. To them, we could be as defenseless as insects are to us. And here's the chilling part. We wouldn't even see it coming. I and a few of my colleagues have uh, spent a fair amount of time trying to find some evidence for intelligent life on Earth. By and large, we've been unsuccessful. Let me explain. Here are some photographs of the planet Earth taken by the American meteorological satellite ATS-1. The white stuff is clouds, the dark stuff uh, is the surface of the Earth, in this case the Pacific Ocean. And as you see, there's no sign of life. Now, here is a photograph of the British Isles, and uh, you can see this is a fairly rare photograph, rare because they're, uh, the British Isles are largely cloud-free. Now, prolonged scrutiny of uh, this photograph uh, reveals uh, no sign of life. This is a photograph taken at one kilometer resolution. That is to say that things smaller than a kilometer would not possibly show up in this picture. Here's a photograph at the same resolution of France. Somewhere in this picture, I've forgotten just where, is Paris. Uh, Paris doesn't show up because there's nothing about Paris that uh, calls it to our attention. You can't see Paris at this sort of resolution. Well, we've looked at several thousands of photographs with this sort of resolution, and we've come to the conclusion that at kilometer resolution, there's no sign of life on Earth, intelligent or otherwise. To get a good sign of, of intelligent life on Earth, we have to get pictures of improved resolution. If we can't even prove our own existence from orbit without technology, how can we expect distant civilizations to notice us unless we announce ourselves? And announce ourselves, we already have. We've been leaking signals into the cosmos for over a century. Radio and television waves drift outward, carrying fragments of our lives. The famous Aritibo message went further deliberately encoding our DNA, our location, even a cosmic greeting card. To us, it was pride. To someone listening, it could be bait. It is a mind-reeling thought to think of the, the information that might one day come, come fluttering through our radio telescopes from an advanced civilization somewhere else. Any communication, I think, will be mostly from them to us because they will have very little to learn from us and probably an enormous amount to teach us, not just in areas of science, but in other areas, some of which we can only dimly guess at today. I don't share George Wald's fears that such a contact would be a disaster. I, I think rather it's a supreme opportunity to learn something. But in any case, we, we can't hold back. We've already communicated our presence to the universe because about 30 or 40 light years away from the Earth, there's a wave front of electromagnetic radiation which is moving away from us at the speed of light. This is the result of our first large-scale radio communications back in the 20s and 30s, and there's no holding that back. That indicates our presence. We've already communicated our presence to the universe. Now, we have before seen the difficulty in determining 
the presence of life on Earth photographically. Were we on Mars, just the same difficulty would, would be the case, but there'd be an easy way to detect life on Earth from Mars. You'd construct a small, modest radio telescope pointed at the Earth, and when the North American continent turned around towards Mars, there'd be this blast of radio emission, which uh, would certainly not be totally random noise, due to domestic television transmission on Earth. It's a very sobering thought, I think, that the, the only signs of intelligent life on Earth detectable over large distances are the often baleful contents of American television programs and uh, the radar defense networks of the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, at the same time, though, I think that it would be very remarkable any extraterrestrial civilization would be able to see it. It's only in the last 40 years that the radio uh, brightness of the Earth increased, and now it's increased at such a rate that at some radio frequencies, the Earth is brighter than the Sun. They would conclude that something extraordinary had certainly happened in the vicinity of the Earth. Sagan often reminded us, if contact happens, it likely won't be us speaking first. It will be them. Any species advanced enough to cross the abyss of space would find us long before we ever found them. That realization alone shifts the balance of power in terrifying ways. How would you send a message to space? What would you say? You obviously don't uh, send out a message in English saying, uh, are you chaps Presbyterians? For one thing, they don't understand English up there. There has to be some method of communication which both the sending and the receiving civilization have in common and doesn't depend on the vagaries of the languages at either end of the communication link. Now, if we use a radio telescope, then the receiving civilization has to also have a radio telescope. That means they must have similar mathematics and similar physics. But even if the day comes when a signal arrives, how do we answer? Suppose we, we design a message like this. Suppose we use two symbols, uh, let's say zero and one, the basis of the familiar binary arithmetic. Let's let a tone of one frequency stand for the zero and a tone of another frequency stand for the one. We can then put together a message that might be something like this. Well, we can't make uh, much sense of this message just yet, but we do notice that the message is repeated in several groups. Each group, each message, contains a certain number of zeros and ones. This number is 2,419. Now, there's something very interesting about 2,419. It's the product of two prime numbers. The two prime numbers are 41 and 59. And this is going to be a fact that's, that's true regardless of what planet the mathematician who's analyzing this happens to be living on. Now, this immediately suggests that we arrange this sequence in a rectangular array, a, a square raster so that we can see if there's any picture that comes out of it. If we arrange it one way and remove the zeros, then we get something like this. This is a picture which shows us nothing of any particular interest, no obvious symmetries, nothing to attract the attention of an extraterrestrial civilization. But suppose the message is arranged in another way. Suppose this message is arranged as 41 lines of 59 columns. Then the extraterrestrials might see coming off their computer a data analysis, something like this. see a man, at least recognizably a man to us. Here is the sun, the orbits of the inner planets of the solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. There's a line connecting the man with the orbit of the third planet, the Earth. All of this seems to be quite clear to us. There are some things which might not be clear to everybody on Earth. For example, this uh, sequence of numbers here, uh, 2, 8, 18, and 32. But certainly, even an extraterrestrial with no prior familiarity with what people look like would be struck by the enormous order and symmetry of such a picture. It could not fail but, but to call attention to it. Now, 
This sort of message and much more sophisticated messages can be sent through space, but over what distances? If we imagine both sending and receiving civilizations using a radio telescope only as advanced as the most complicated one on Earth, the most advanced one on Earth, the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, it turns out that communication could be established over the astonishing distance of a thousand light years. Carl Sagan wrestled with this puzzle. Words and languages divide us here on Earth, but numbers, physics, and prime sequences, those are universal. Mathematics becomes the bridge. Yet even with the bridge, the risk remains. Every piece of information we send is a piece of ourselves, exposed. And what should that first message say? Is it a poem of who we are? A map of where we live? Or should it be silence? A refusal to play the cosmic game at all? Here's the dilemma Sagan never let us forget. In our eagerness to be heard, we may be writing our own epitaph. What if the universe is quiet, not because it's empty, but because everyone who spoke too loudly is already gone? Imagine this, a civilization calls out, proud, hopeful, they are heard, and then they vanish, not by accident, but by design. The silence of the cosmos may not be absence, but warning, and yet we keep sending signals. Voyager's golden record now drifts into interstellar space, carrying greetings in dozens of languages, our music, even directions back to Earth. Carl Sagan himself helped shape it, but he knew the haunting truth. It might be the most dangerous invitation ever sent. So here we are, suspended on a pale blue dot, caught between wonder and dread. Do we remain quiet forever, terrified of what might hear us, or do we embrace the risk, knowing the answer could change everything or end everything? Carl Sagan left us with both hope and warning. His words echo like a ghost in the void. For small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. But love may not be enough. And so we wait, in silence and in fear, asking the question that has no safe answer. When the universe finally answers back, will it be the voice of a friend? or the last sound humanity ever hears. What did you think about today's journey? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I read every single one. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss what's coming next. We've got more strange, unsettling, and fascinating stories from the universe headed your way. Until then, stay safe and stay curious.